What triggers the cycle of political violence in West Bengal, a state known for its rich culture and intellectual prowess? This is a question that has long puzzled observers. West Bengal, a state steeped in tradition, with a vibrant intellectual and cultural life, has paradoxically been a hotbed of political violence for decades. This paradox becomes even more baffling when we cast our minds back to the 1960s and 70s. These were the early instances of such violence as political ideologies clashed, often violently, on the streets of Kolkata and other cities. It was a time when the state's intellectual prowess seemed to be at odds with the escalating violence that was beginning to grip it. The roots of this violence are deep, intertwined with the state's history and politics. They are not easy to unravel, but it is essential to do so if we are to understand the ongoing violence. As we delve deeper, we'll see how these early instances laid the groundwork for the ongoing violence. The seeds of political violence in West Bengal were sown in the 1960s. This decade witnessed a significant shift in the state's political landscape with the rise of the Naxalbari movement. The movement started as a peasants' revolt in the rural Naxalbari region of West Bengal, but it soon morphed into an armed struggle against the establishment, led by radical leftists who were inspired by the principles of Mao Zedong. Their aim was to incite a revolution through an agrarian war, overthrowing the existing social and political order. The Naxalbari movement was not just a political phenomenon, it was a social upheaval. It stirred the rural population, particularly the landless laborers and the poor peasants, into action. The movement's call for land to the tiller resonated deeply with those who had long suffered exploitation and deprivation. However, this period also witnessed escalated violence. The state's response to the movement was brutal. Police and paramilitary forces were dispatched to quell the rebellion, leading to widespread atrocities and human rights violations. The violence was not limited to the combatants. It spilled over into the society, affecting innocent lives and causing deep-seated fear and resentment. The political impact of the Naxalbari movement was equally profound. It led to a sharp polarization of the political landscape in West Bengal. On one side were the mainstream political parties, who were seen as representatives of the establishment. On the other side were the radical leftists, who positioned themselves as champions of the downtrodden. This polarization only deepened the fissures in the society, paving the way for more violence and unrest in the future. In retrospect, the Naxalbari movement was a turning point in the history of West Bengal. It marked the beginning of a cycle of political violence that would continue for decades. The 1960s left an indelible mark on West Bengal, setting the stage for decades to come. As we moved into the 1970s, the violence escalated, taking on new forms and intensities. A new decade had dawned, but peace was still a distant dream for West Bengal. The 1970s witnessed political violence spiraling into a vortex of chaos. This was an era of escalation, where the political landscape was smeared with blood and turmoil. High on the list of horrors were political assassinations. The stage was set for a grim dance of death, with political figures falling prey to the deadly game of power. These were not random acts of violence, but meticulously planned and executed operations, aimed at destabilizing the political order. The assassination sent shockwaves through the state, amplifying the fear and tension that had already gripped the people. But the violence was not just limited to the corridors of power. It spilled onto the streets, into the universities, and even the classrooms. Student politics, once a platform for youthful idealism and change, was now a breeding ground for violence and discord. The academic sanctuaries were transformed into battlegrounds, with rival student groups clashing over ideologies and power. The role of student politics in the escalation of violence cannot be overstated. It was a catalyst, fueling the fire and propelling the cycle of violence into a higher gear. As the decade progressed, the situation grew increasingly dire. The violence was no longer just a political tool. It had become a part of the social fabric. It was a grim reality that the people of West Bengal had to live with every day. The cycle of violence had taken on a life of its own, feeding on the fear and despair of the people. The 70s ended on a grim note, leaving West Bengal in a state of turmoil. It was a decade that would be remembered for its political assassinations, the rise of student politics, and the escalating cycle of violence. A decade that witnessed the transformation of a state, once known for its rich culture and intellectual prowess, into a battleground. From the 1980s to the present day, the cycle of political violence in West Bengal has continued unabated. As we journey through the decades, the persistence of this violence becomes starkly evident, laid bare in the harsh light of historical retrospection. It's a tempest that rages on, regardless of the winds of political change. 
The 1980s saw the rise and fall of various political parties, each with their own leaders, ideologies, and promises of change. Yet the undercurrent of violence remained a constant, an insidious thread woven seamlessly into West Bengal's political tapestry. The 1990s and the early years of the new millennium were no different. With each political shift, hopes of a fresh start were kindled, only to be doused by the chilling reality of continued aggression. Violence had become an unwelcome guest, overstaying its welcome, and with each passing year, it seemed to settle in more comfortably, etching its presence deeper into the state's soul. And what of the impact? The social fabric of West Bengal, once vibrant and diverse, has been marred by the relentless onslaught of political violence. Communities have been divided, relationships strained, and the harmony of everyday life disrupted. The echoes of this violence reverberate beyond the political sphere, permeating the very essence of society. The political landscape, too, bears the scars of this unending cycle. Parties have been fractured, leaders toppled, and the democratic process tainted. The pillars of governance and law have been shaken, the very foundations of the state's political structure threatened. The current decade is no exception. Despite the changing faces at the helm, the cycle of violence spins on, its momentum seemingly unstoppable. It's a grim narrative, one that has been written and rewritten over the past 40 years, each chapter echoing the same haunting refrain. Despite the passage of time, the specter of political violence continues to cast a long shadow over West Bengal. A shadow that for now shows no sign of shrinking, as the cycle of violence remains unbroken. So what have we learned about the ongoing cycle of political violence in West Bengal? We've journeyed back to the origins of this turbulence, to a time when the state was at a crossroads. The seeds of division were sown, and the stage was set for a tumultuous period. We watched as the early sparks of discord ignited into a full-fledged inferno. It wasn't a sudden explosion, but a steady escalation, fueled by deep-seated resentments and power struggles. Over the decades, the violence intensified, becoming a part of West Bengal's political fabric. And where are we today? In a state where political violence is not an anomaly, but an expectation, a cycle unbroken, a pattern that repeats itself election after election, year after year, it's a cycle that has become ingrained in the state's political culture, and its persistence raises serious questions about the future of West Bengal. What does this mean for the people of West Bengal? For one, it means living in a state of constant uncertainty and fear. It means their voices are often drowned out by the noise of violence. It means that the democratic process, which should be a peaceful expression of the people's will, is often marred by bloodshed. And what about the future? If this cycle continues unabated, can West Bengal truly progress? Can it break free from the shackles of its past and carve a path towards a peaceful, prosperous future? These are questions that demand answers, answers that can only come from addressing the deep-seated issues that fuel this violence. The implications are clear. Without addressing the roots of this conflict, the cycle of violence may continue to spin. It's a cycle that, if left unchecked, could jeopardize the state's future, stunting its growth and keeping it trapped in a state of perpetual unrest. Until the roots of this violence are addressed, West Bengal may continue to be trapped in this unending cycle.